Uh, welcome everybody to our panel uh, discussion titled Reproductive, Reproduction, Sexuality and War, Reflections from Latin America. My name is Julieta Chaparro. I am a lecturer in the sociology department at the University of Cambridge and I'm also a member of the Reproductive Sociology Research Group, ReproSoc. And today I will be chairing this panel discussion, which uh, it's going to be a very interesting conversation uh, connecting questions of uh, sexuality and reproduction in uh, post-Accord Colombia. So let me explain how the panel is gonna work. I am gonna start us off with some initial remarks that provide a, back, you know, like a general background for an audience. Then the panelists will introduce a little bit of their work and themselves. Uh, then we're gonna go around um, talking or addressing some questions that we have prepared in advance. And then we'll open the floor for the audience to ask any questions answered by uh, ReproSoc and the Instituto Pensar uh, at, the, at the University of uh, Javeriana University in Colombia. So the, uh, the idea of this panel came after I read the introduction or the, the special issue of bureaucracy, justice, and the state of post accord Colombia that was published in the Political Legal Anthropology Review. Uh, two of our panelists today published two interesting pieces analyzing post-accord Colombia using reproduction as, as the lens for uh, making that analysis. And, and I wanted to bring that conversation that is happening in Latin America and in Colombia, in, in this case in particular, to this already vibrant ReproSol community uh, to put in conversation what it's been doing in Reprosoc and what it's uh, this new emerging body of work looking at questions of war and political transitions from the lenses of reproduction and sexuality. Um, so as we know, reproduction and sexuality are not a private matter. Feminists have said this for a long time um, and they have, and instead they are um, subjected to public contention. So discussions about public funding for reproductive health or regulation of abortion come to mind as clear examples of this. But reproduction and sexuality, as many feminist scholars have also demonstrated, um, animate debates about immigration, nationalism, and imperialism, or to use Laura Briggs' words, when we talk about immigration or the economy, for example, we are talking about reproductive politics because families raising children are always at stake in this conversation. And a good example of this is the debate of family separation policy in the US. So today in this panel, we're going to explore with the panelists how any conversation around political transition in Colombia is also linked to reproduction and sexuality. And what can we gain from looking at this from these, uh, these two different frameworks? So I'm going to give you a brief context of the 2016 Colombia Accord and here running the risk of sounding a bit superficial, but still I, I think it's important to give the audience a little bit of a basic details that later on the panelists will expand a little bit more as, they, as, as we talk. Uh, so the government of Juan Manuel Santos and the Revolutionary Armed Forces of Colombia, People's Army, signed a peace agreement in 2016 after almost four years of intense negotiations in Havana, Cuba. Guerrilla organizations, including FARC, but not exclusively, including but not exclusive FARC, erupted in the political scene in Colombia in the 1960s as a result, among other reasons, of the narrow political spectrum that characterized the alternation of power between the liberal and the conservative parties, which is known in the Colombian historiography as the National Front. There had been previous negotiations between the Colombian state and FARC, uh, but the 2016 peace accord achieved the demobilization and disarmament of this guerrilla organization that at that point was the oldest guerrilla in the world. And here we're using post accord to mark the undulating dynamic of violence that disrupts the linear pre post conflict framework that has been traditionally used to characterize political transitions from war to peace. So scholars working on transitional justice have shown how peace agreements do not really mean the end of violence. Urban violence, for instance, went on the rise after the Peruvian Secret Service dismantled the Shining Path or the Maoist guerrilla organization. And in Colombia, we are witnessing a tide of selective assassinations of social leaders. 
Um, what also happens in this context is that after demobilization in Colombia, for example, extractivist industries increase in territories that were previously under FARC control. And we know from you know, research done on extractivism, when these industries arrive into territories, it reinvigorates or unleashes various forms of violence uh, through private armies, the destruction of the environment, forced displacement, land grab, and various forms of gender-based violence. And here I just want to note two important contributions of the Truth Commission. On the one hand, it incorporated gender as a transversal category for understanding violence. So it allows to understand the particular ways in which the violence impacted the lives of girls and women, and also the lives of sexual and gender non-conforming bodies, which have been subjected to hate crimes, to various forms of sexual violence, along with other forms of harm. And Dr. Bueno Hansen is gonna tell us a little bit more of that uh, during the conversation. An important innovation of the Truth Commission in Colombia is incorporation of reproductive violence in its investigation. And this is really new. No other Truth Commission have incorporated reproductive related issues uh, on its own right, right? So usually what happens is that these issues get subsumed under gender as a broader category or gender lines like happened in Peru, for example, or in Guatemala. Uh, different organizations and researchers, including the panelists that we have today, have written reports revealing the extent on motivations behind forced abortion, forced contraception, differentiated infertility, and forced motherhood. However, as we will hear later on from Vanessa Giraldo's work, the idea that abortion and contraception can be simply visibilized through the framework of victimhood flattens the complexity of abortion politics and a rich history of women combatants on negotiation for reproductive freedom. Despite all the complexities that this brings, um, an important outcome of centering reproduction in the Truth Commission is that reproductive violence is no longer seen as a byproduct of other forms of violence, such as kidnapping or torture. And it allows us to understand that it is central, reproductive violence allows and enables the exercise of forms of masculine viol um, violence, and I would argue also forms of territorial control. And today we're gonna hear more of the broader implications of reproductive violence incorporation of this category in the Truth Commission. And just as a final word here, I want to finish this introduction addressing the recent events that have unfolded in Colombia in the last two weeks. The massive uprising that you have probably seen uh, in newspaper articles and have circulated through social media is, as many analysts in Colombia have said, the result or or is connected to the peace accord. Uh, these generated expectations around the pacification of the country, along uh, with a much needed agenda for social justice. But unfortunately, none of these expectations have been fulfilled. And then the, on top of this, the COVID-19 pandemic has only intensified the inequalities that were important drivers behind the armed confrontation that started in the 60s. Um, and in this panel, we want to use this opportunity to visibilize the situation. And I know the panelists are very committed to what is happening in Colombia, and we're going to talk a little bit more of what is happening. And I just want to mention, if you want to help uh, if you're there are a couple of ways we can do this. Uh, on the one hand, if you're planning on tweeting about the panel, you can use the hashtag uh, SOS Colombia or hashtag SOS, SOS Cali. Uh, you can contact your local MPs or your, lo or your local politicians, wherever you are located, to ask them to express their concern about the human rights situation in Colombia. This, would, this can help to put pressure on the government to end the violence against protesters. Uh, and you can also organize local demonstrations in your local embassy, in the Colombian embassies, wherever you are located. So this is a way of showing uh, your support for the Colombian people who are asking for justice uh, in, a, in a context that is just um, absolutely dramatic. So um, now uh, we are gonna go around and have some introductions by our panelists today. We're gonna start with um, Pasha Bueno Hansen. So the floor is yours, Pasha. Good afternoon, 
to everybody and thank you so much for this opportunity to share space and make some reflections. Um, I am connecting here from the Northern Atlantic coast of the Americas, the ancestral territory of the Lenai Lenape. And this is also known as the state of Delaware of the United States. I very much appreciate that Julieta Chaparro acknowledged this extreme sociopolitical crisis in Colombia and um, the need to take a global stance against the militarization of Colombia and the slaughter of people in numbers and the disappearance that is just giving me chills every time I open the news. So um, I am located in the United States and I take it very seriously to speak to my governmental representatives to take a stand against this brutal violence. So um, while we are focusing on Colombia, um, I also want to sort of weave in some of the experiences from Peru and um, the experiences in Peru deeply inform the kind of work that's taking place in Colombia. So there's, there's, a, there's a continuity of trajectory of feminist interventions and transitional justice efforts, of course, in the region. And what I wanna bring us to is, um, I wanna bring us into a moment in Peru in 2006. And I want to bring you into um, a part of the research that became the basis of my first book entitled Feminist and Human Rights Struggles in Peru Decolonizing Transitional Justice. And um, in this work, I accompanied a Peruvian feminist non-governmental organization called DEMUS to the Highland Andean Highland community of Manta in the department of Huancavelica. And during that year, we traveled from Lima to Manta, and we spent a week each month there. Huancavelica is one of the Andean departments that was most hard hit by the proven internal armed conflict that started in 1980 and lasted about two decades. And Manta was one of the communities that was occupied by a counter guerrilla military base between 1984 and 1995. And the Peruvian Truth and Reconciliation Commission um, which did its investigation in the early 2000s, recognized the sexual violence that took place in Manta as emblematic of how the military perpetrated this human rights violation against Andean Quechua speaking and also Amazonian ethno-linguistic communities in rural contexts in and around military bases. So this feminist NGO, Demus, took up that case in the sort of post truth commission moment in you know the mid 2000s and i just want to share this moment that has stuck with me and really defined a uh, one of the trajectories of my work as it traverses these key um, themes that we're discussing today reproduction sexuality and war and transitional justice law and violence so I remember one night in Manta with the um, field work team of Demos. And um, you know, there was no electricity in, in Manta. So it, you, you just pitch dark kind of night. And um, we heard a knock at our door. And that night, the first woman of the community had decided to come to talk to us and give her testimony of the violence, the sexual violence that she had endured and survived during the internal armed conflict. And the attorney of our interdisciplinary team, mm -hmm. you know, was just absolutely just electrified by this and quickly gathered herself and the rest of us just, you know, quietly put ourselves into a space where we wouldn't be noticed. And, and, and the, the, the attorney um, brought this person to uh, our space and during hours of burning candle after candle received her testimony. And we sat quietly in the silence and the darkness in another little space. And, and what I wanna highlight here is the emotional, the collective emotional intensity of that moment. 
And what it brought to us was this incredibly powerful sense of responsibility to accompany this case to its, to its end. And here I mark this as a key experience among many others, but the one I want to mark today as orienting my efforts to accompany the protagonists of this case over the last 15 years. This case is in trial now, and the protagonists are enduring some pretty brutal re-victimizing and dehumanizing interrogations. Mm -hmm. And this case is the second in the Latin American region besides the Guatemalan case that Buzarco in which sexual violence during internal armed conflict is being tried in a national court as a crime against humanity. So I'll open with that and pass it off to our next speaker. So the next uh, presenter is Tatiana Sanchez and I forgot to introduce Pasha. I am so sorry about this. Pasha is an associate professor of women and gender studies at the University of El Delaware in the US. And as she mentioned, her first book, Feminist and Human Rights Struggles in Peru Decolonizing Transitional Justice was also published as a translation in the Instituto de Estudios Peruanos. Um, the next panelist is Tatiana Sanchez Parra. She is an assistant professor at the University of Social and Cultural Studies, Pensar at the Javeriana University in Colombia. She works at the intersection of feminist, social legal studies, anthropology of violence, and medical anthropology. So Tatiana, mm -hmm. the floor is yours. Thank you very much. And thank you, Julieta, for organizing this event and for inviting us to be part of this conversation. And Thank you to my amazing colleagues and friends who are here sharing the space with me and to everyone who's here uh, sharing the round table with us. Um, I just wanna very briefly join Pasha and Julieta in what they've said about the awful outrageous repression we are living in Colombia at the moment. It's not new, uh, either repression or resistance, that's something we know about. Uh, and at the same time, it is something that right now we would really appreciate and need the international eyes on Colombia. So if you can join uh, international efforts and if you can join networks of support uh, to make visible and to assist in whichever way you can, this situation we are going through, that's, uh, well, that will make a difference. Mm, and with that, I wanna start with uh, sharing my presentation. Uh, hold on a moment. I just, of course, lost my document. Mm, so I'm gonna, in this part of my presentation, I'm just gonna share very briefly something about my work on reproductive violence and particularly on narratives about people born as a result of war-related sexual violence in Colombia and forced motherhood. Mm, so, Okay, and just to be uh, fair with time and not get lost, I'm gonna read a short piece that I wrote. So I don't know if you've heard about that boy who attacked his little brother with a machete. Doña Clemencia asked me while we were taking a break from the hot midday sun under the shade of a man tree. Doña Clemencia told me a story that became recurrent during those months of field work in San Miguel an Afro-Colombian community of around 400 people located in the north of Cauca that endured a paramilitary occupation for over four years. It was the story of a teenager who was out of control, whose behavior was both representative of the aggressiveness of the current times and was escalating in a worrisome way. It was not until later during those months of field, works, uh, field work in one of those long conversations that I had with Astrid, who was the spokeswoman of the community during the collective reparation negotiations with the government, that I understood that a paramilitary was the biological father of the young person in those stories. That young man was indeed one of those people who at some point in their lives had been associated with a very cruel label, paraquito, little paramilitary, a label that encompasses so many forms of violence, but that is hardly here nowadays. Um, Astrid was telling me how young people in San Miguel had more access to primary and high school education than people in the past, and yet the opportunities for making a living seem to be more restricted. 
with them often having to work under very exploitative conditions for the sugarcane industry or as mates in Cali. At some point during this conversation with Astrid, she referred to the story of that teenager. And she said, it backfired on her, you know, all this time his mom has been yelling at him, mistreating him, telling him to stand up for himself against the world. And this has backfired. She tells him to defend himself because he is the son of a paraco, a paramilitary. And now we see the consequences. Now, in my explorations about reproductive violence and people born as a result of war related sexual violence in Colombia, I have identified at least three social places where information about them circulates. So first, in the testimonies their mothers share of different forms of sexual violence committed by members of all armed groups in Colombia and also in militarized landscapes. We find information about them in their testimonies of forced pregnancies, of giving birth in context of obstetric violence and often due to lack of access to the right to safe abortion. Second, I've also found information about them in those labeling practices as I shared in the story uh, I shared a moment ago. Uh, and this, so a couple of years after a very controversial paramilitary demobilization in 25, human rights practitioners and particularly people working with national women's organizations in various were affected, affected parts of the country, started hearing these stories that really spread as rumors. And those were stories of how, in some communities, people were using the label of paraquito, little paramilitary, to refer to those children born um, of the paramilitary abuses. And the third place where I found information about them circulating is in the creation of the legal category. Mm, so in 2011, Colombia was the first country in the world to include the category of children born uh, of war in its transitional justice legislation, recognizing them as official victims of the armed conflict and therefore entitled to redress. Mm, now, in spite of those forms of visibility, people born of war remain mostly unseen to the institutions and agencies that seek to address the consequences of the armed conflict. And we know there are various forms of silence around and about war related sexual violence. However, this is not solely a story of silence for silence requires knowledge and the power of concealment. What I have encountered in my research is that this is a story of unintelligibility. Their presence and transgenerational experiences of war and the experiences of their mothers of forced motherhood remain unseen, as they are often not understood as reproductive violence, but as collateral damage of war-related sexual violence and as part of women's natural reproductive labor. And very briefly, I want to finish um, by saying that part of the work we do through our feminist alliances and struggles is to challenge the dominant frameworks through which we understand, think, write, and, and experience the world. Not only to render visible intersectional experiences of reproductive violence, but also to gain spaces for life and to be able to dream of futures free of reproductive violence. And I think that we can see an example of this in the alliances and the struggles uh, represented in the work of the Colombian Truth Commission, particularly uh, its gender team. Mm, so as Julieta mentioned before, the Colombian Truth Commission is the first body of its kind to globally address reproductive violence and to actively include it in its investigations. And as specific forms of violence, like for example, involuntary abortion caused by governments aerial fumigations with glyphosate or forced motherhood. Um, the commission will finish its report in November this year. And I don't wanna sound naive, but there is an opportunity here, not only to render visible specific forms and patterns of violence and keep just challenging the dominant frameworks, but also to dream in terms of recommendations and not guarantees of non-repetition, guarantees of non-recurrence. Uh, I want to finish there. I think I just talked for a bit too long. So. Thanks, Tatiana.
Our next uh, panelist is Vanessa Giraldo. Vanessa Giraldo is a medical anthropologist with a primary area of specialization in Colombia and a research focus on reproductive politics, particularly in relation to armed conflict, peace transition, rural reforms, and intercultural health. She is a PhD candidate at the University of Massachusetts Amherst in the Department of, of, of Anthropology. And she has a master's in public health from the National University of Colombia. So Vanessa, uh, the floor is yours. Thank you so much, Julieta. It's really a pleasure to be here. Uh, hello, everyone. Thank you so much for making me part of this uh, very productive conversation. And uh, of course, I want to join my colleagues and friends bringing Colombia to our thoughts. And I want to dedicate some words to the families of more than 40 people who have been killed during the last two weeks of protest in Colombia and almost 400 people who have been forcibly disappeared. We are waiting for you to come back home. So I joined from the Amazon region of Colombia, a place called Caquetá, uh, the ancestral territory of Huitoto and Coreguaje communities, and an area with a long history of armed violence that has mainly affected indigenous and peasant communities. Um, from here, I work with women who participated as combatants in left-wing guerrilla movements, in particular in the farc -EP, about reproductive politics of war and peace. I have worked on reproductive rights with women in rural areas, including ex-combatant women for probably more than 10 years, and um, started to think about reproductive bodies and reproductive experience in experiences in the armed conflict during peace negotiations between uh, the former guerrilla group farc -EP and the Colombian government, where, as Julieta mentioned, uh, where there was a lot of attention about forced abortions in this group. So I decided to explore the stories behind those women who were forced to abort and were represented as the victims and frustrated mothers um, to be rescued by the government. When abortion was and uh, is still denied for most Colombian women right now. And I realized that reproductive policies have been a central part of the political and military transformation of guerrilla groups in Colombia from grassroots grassroots movements in the 60s to revolutionary armies in the 90s and now to um, their transformation into a political party. So interestingly, guerrilla women in the 70s were one of the first groups to demand access to abortion in Colombia, inspired by the emergence of other guerrilla groups in Latin America that incorporated female fighters combatant women in Colombia demanded access to contraception and abortion so they could participate in the revolutionary struggle with their male comrades on an equal basis. They demanded the same rights and duties and to equally distribute both military and domestic tasks. However, more uh, than a statement about motherhood as a free choice, it was about motherhood as incompatible with the armed revolution. Motherhood, according to them, should be postponed after a more equal society was achieved because the armed conflict was of course not expected to last forever. Armed violence had a specific goal and a timeline in the agenda of guerrilla movements. But in Colombia, the war has not ended. Colonial violence, bipartisan violence, state violence, insurgent violence, paramilitary violence, and drug traffic violence intersect and reproduce each other in perverse loops, taking the lives of generations. So what had been a triumph for Farianas, the name for women in the FARC, the achievement of reproductive rights within their group, turned into one of the most important forms of violence against them. With the upsurge of violence in the 1990s, reproductive policies were severely, severely toughened in order to keep female soldiers suitable for combat and limit affective relationships outside the group. 
the restricted pregnancies by making contraception compulsory and forcing some women to abort. The pregnancy ban became a central biopolitical practice to produce women as militarized subjects. As an ex-combatant uh, woman told me, contraception made us soldiers and also facilitated the massive enrollment of women who reached up to 20 to 30 percent of the fighting force, according to the state army intelligence reports, and 40 percent according to FARC's uh, self-reports. Although not all abortions were forced, and that's very important to highlight, the testimonies of ex-combatant women confirmed that when contraception failed during the most intense times of the armed conflict, the policy was for them to abort or send the baby to a relative or a surrogate family. But violence did not only come from the guerrilla group. Women who managed to finish their pregnancies because they either received permission from their commanders or hid their pregnancies or fled the group were exposed to the state military forces and paramilitary groups violence. They were persecuted when they left the battlefield to give birth or visit their children and some of these children were lost or placed for adoption without their mother's consent. However, during peace negotiations, <clears throat> The conversation about reproductive policies in the FARC became exclusively about forced abortion and became a site of contestation about meanings of peace, gender, and nation. As um, many authors have described about reproduction in times of political and economic transitions, statements about forced abortions represented in a way the position of the different social groups involved in the negotiations. Each of them created a subject in relation to the stories of abortion that projected what the peace agreement meant for them. So FARC leaders, we're talking about the revolutionary women who in line with the gender perspective of the agreement demanded abortion as a right. Anti-peace accord movements created the image of the fetus victim as a moral deviation and accused the FARC of promoting, probably you've heard about this, a gender ideology which they believe is an international movement to legalize abortion, corrupt children, promote homosexuality, impose communism, and destroy families. Feminist NGOs talked about Farianas as victims and the need of reparation in the post-accord. And finally, the press that was supporting the government in its efforts to successfully conclude peace negotiations connected the stories of abortion with the new stories of female combatants who had babies at the end of peace negotiations. Maybe some of you um, heard about the baby boom of the FARC. That occurred when the pregnancy ban was removed and they were transitioning to civil life. Images of harmless moms putting aside their weapons to take care of their babies colonized popular representations of ex-combatants in the national and international press. The subject of the press then was the heroic mother who vindicated the name of the FARC through the sacred symbols of motherhood, strongly attached, attached here in Colombia and Latin America to Virgin Mary. The heroic mother showed the peace accord as the restitution of heteronormative family and gender norms in the aftermath of war. However, after the signature of the accord, ex-combatant women have done more than exchanging rifles for babies. And with the support of national and international organizations, they have established an agenda for sexual and reproductive rights that includes dignified conditions for mothering. In more than 50 years of armed conflict, both mechanisms to govern women's reproductive behavior and women's, res women's responses emerged through the violent tensions between the state 
and the insurgency. So in my work, I relocate the conversation of reproduction and war, not to think about it only as a source of gender-based violence, but to put it at the very center of the biopolitical and necropolitical projects of war and peace. Reproductive politics produced women as soldiers, defined the moral scenario for peace negotiations and orient ex-combatant women's agendas in the aftermath of war. I would leave there. Yeah, thanks so much. Uh, such a powerful introduction. I think it gives us a neat, really interesting overview of the different perspectives that each of you are bringing to the table and to this conversation. And what I'm hearing here, uh, and, and, or the most salient aspect that uh, jumps out at me after listening to you, is these disputes that emerge around the categories that we use for making the violence visible, right? What are the terminology, what are the conceptual frameworks that we use as researchers uh, to make the, the, um, this violence visible? And at the same time, what are the gaps that emerge from, in this case, legal categories such as victim and the lived experience? So I wanted to start us off with uh, with a round of, uh, with a discussion around uh, epistemological frameworks that all of you use in your work for analyzing reproduction, sexuality, and war. Um, and I would like to hear a little bit more about the concepts or the authors that you work with, um, and perhaps a reflection on the potential limitations of some of these concepts that we have for the study of reproduction when we use them for the analysis in, in Latin America. And this is just something that uh, emerged after I'm listening to you. Because it's interesting, something that Tatiana mentioned at some point, and it's like, we need to challenge the dominant frameworks to make or to gain spaces for life. And I think that's such an interesting and powerful insight. And it's precisely why reproduction is such a capacious concept, is because we're talking about the fundamental aspects of life and death. So I wanted to hear a little bit of your reflections on, on you know, epistemology and epistemological frameworks that you use in your research. So we can start whoever wants to jump in and feels um, that wants to say something, start us off. I'm fine to start and we could just keep going in the same order. Does that sound yeah, good? Yeah, that sounds good. Okay, so I'll start by saying that um, in studying uh, processes, phenomena, experiences in Latin America, one of the things that I, and, and being in the North, right, in the United States, one of the things that I am very committed to is rooting um, my work and my epistemological frameworks in um, Latin American knowledge production and praxis. Because if I, fundamentally, if, if we're looking at Latin American situations, it makes most sense to use Latin American knowledge production and praxis to inform that analysis. And I would say that there's three main sort of uh, trajectories or threads that aren't necessarily discrete that I find to be particularly useful. And I'll, I'll, I'll name each one and give a quick example for each one. So I work within kind of the productive tensions and overlaps of these three. And the first one is Latin American decolonial feminism, which you know centrally questions coloniality and heterosexism. And I find that to be particularly useful when we think about in terms of specifically uh, sexual violence, how um, this framework brings to light the historical patterns of violence and how these historical patterns are anchored in, in colonialism. And in particular, the example of Manta and how that community had its own narratives to comprehend um, what was happening, right? And those narratives linked and sutured and stitched across different temporal moments from colonial relations to the independence movement of Peru to um, the kinds of atrocious violences that were um, perpetrated by feudal landlords who had absolute impunity because of their relationships with regional elites. And then of course, what happened with the military base. So thinking uh, outside of the linear temporality and, and, and really centrally positioning the knowledge of the community and how they interpret what has happened and how it's related to these other 
other types of uh, moments of extreme abuse. The second um, thread that has been extremely helpful for my thinking is Latin American trans feminism, which centrally challenges cis and heteronormativity, as well as single issue identity politics. And I found this to be a, a particularly salient um, thread of thinking because it really upends um, the, the, the normative ways we might read, for example, this dynamic of gender ideology campaigns, right? And through this, through the trans feminist frame, we can plainly see how cis and heteronormativity are systems of social control and how they are particularly activated during political transitions and how um, cis and heteronormativity shore up the nation state just as Tatiana was highlighting and how cis and heteronormative family um, models, ideal cis and heteronormative family models are key to this system. And that this is exactly what the anti-gender movement is going to uphold and reinforce through these gender ideology campaigns. And then the third piece that I find extremely important and helpful is Latin American indigenous territorial communitarian feminisms. And I find these, um, these to be extremely powerful coming out of Guatemala and, and Bolivia in particular, but you know, across the region that challenge the even challenge the decolonial idea that the colonial encounter is the starting point of the analysis, right? And questioning what they call, uh, what many have put forward, especially Lorena Cabnal as the entronque patriarcal, the ways in which the colonial encounter um, created these sort of intermeshings of colonial patriarchal formations that would knit together somehow with um, autochthonous or indigenous patriarchal formations in a way that would benefit a sort of a subjugated indigenous masculinity, but at the same time, the, the, the clear loser are the indigenous women in every case, in every form and fashion. Um, in addition, I find it incredibly useful because it allows us to reconceptualize territory as the indivisible connection between body and land. And that helps us, and I'll take this to um, a, a current case in Colombia, which is um, a case of sexual violence against a young woman, a, a young Wiwa woman who, um, who was in preparation to become a spiritual leader for the community. And um, the way in which the Wiwa are preparing for this case, which includes profound spiritual preparation, right? That all of the frameworks of comprehending what that damage is, not just individually, but across community, across interrelatedness, across land, water, air, and all of the living and earth beings, all of this um, creates these incredible ontological and epistemological gaps between legal approaches mm -hmm. and the and the community's understandings, right? And the, what helps to really kind of get tra traction in reading those gaps is this indigenous territorial communitarian feminism. So those are some of the, the entry points that I wanted to offer today. Yeah, and that's such a interesting framework because especially the body territory of the communitarian feminisms have really emerged precisely by from the experience of violence that indigenous women in Guatemala, for example, but also forms of violence through extractivism that women in Bolivia had experienced, that it has become an interesting framework for thinking about the, the links between violence, bodies, and territories as something that needs to be understood in connection, not as a separation, as a body and a territory, but really how through bodies, territories are controlled, and at the same time, how territories mean the control of the people and the bodies that live in particular territories. And I think that also links to histories of colonization, as Pasha was saying, 
um, longer arcs of violence that really express themselves in the current moment through armed violence or extractivism, for example. But this is actually a longer, a longer history of abuse that indigenous women have been, and indigenous and black uh, women have been disproportionately subjected to historically. So thanks for that, those insights that were uh, super interesting. Uh, let's go with uh, Tatiana. Um, so in my case, so when I started thinking about reproductive violence, I wasn't thinking about reproductive violence. Uh, mm -hmm. I wasn't thinking through those frameworks or the frameworks of uh, reproductive justice. So initially, like in 2012, uh, when I started thinking about children born as a result of what related sexual violence, my frameworks were those of silence, concealment, uh, mm -hmm. and that was my, so my attention was, those were my filters, let's say. So, uh, and my, my attention was placed on why I couldn't find information. Why, why was there, why was there uh, these great areas, right? That, I, that we couldn't read. And, uh, and back then, then my frameworks of like theoretical frameworks were based on Vina Das and Kimberly Thaydon and mm -hmm. you know, for concealment, like Michael Tausig and Alejandro Castillejo talking about Colombian anthropologist mm -hmm. who is now a, a truth commissioner for yeah. the truth commission. Yeah. Mm -hmm. But then it was not until later, I think, that I understood that you no know, silence, concealment and intelligibility mm -hmm were not only gender, but that they took place and have meaning within a, capital, a capitalist patriarchal system that is racist, sexist, that they're heteronormative. Um, so intersectionality came as an approach that unveiled so many other layers of complexity to those silences, concealment, and, and, intelli and intelligibility. I don't know why I use that word so much if it's so hard to pronounce. Um, <laughs> And so decolonial feminisms there gave me also a different framework, a broader framework, I feel, to understand things like, or to question things like uh, this idea of neutrality, for example, coming from law or citizenship, and the work there of Rita Segato, uh, mm -hmm. no, Silvia, Silvia Rivera Cusicanqui with, uh, you know, with internal uh, colonialism interno have been key in forming my theoretical frameworks. Mm. And yet, as you can see, I was already talking about uh, the role of the labor of reproduction in rendering invisible the transgenerational experience of these people born of war and, and how you know, the focus was, oh, the, oh these people were mm, not understood as individual subjects because no, it was their mother's responsibility and it fell under the, the reproductive labor of women. But I wasn't thinking really in terms of reproductive violence. Uh, and it was not until I started reading the work of Silvia Federici and the work of Raquel Gutierrez that I started thinking in terms of social reproduction and understanding how reproductive labor is not key to the reproduction of capital. Uh, and I think it was not until that that I started naming and approaching, even questioning you know, those relationships as forced motherhood. Mm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think those are, that's the trajectory um, so far. Yeah, that's, uh, that's actually very interesting because I think that a lot of us that start this kind of research, working on questions of war and violence, we come from memory studies, perhaps, or human rights. And then when we start doing the work, then we realize that the, the framework is so limited, precisely because it doesn't allow us to understand the gender aspects of war, how that impacts reproduction. And something very interesting that Tatiana, you're saying, is this, this mutual interrelation between reproductive labor and reproductive violence. Because I've also found that in my work and how forms of uh, reproductive violence have effects on um, people's capacity to work and you know, in, in questions of social reproduction in general. So it's a really interesting uh, 
putting these things together and also to understand this shift between reproductive violence, uh, most of the women that you, the women that you talk to subjected to forms of sexual violence then forced to be mothers and then just invisibilizing that violence under the, the imperative of motherhood as a natural mm -hmm. and as a given um, expectation from them, right? So it's a really interesting interconnection that you're building there. Um, and, and I think that uh, it really it, it really shows how reproduction really is connected to uh, all these questions of, of violence and war in ways that are not um, perhaps uh, useful through other frameworks like memory studies, for example. Mm -hmm. Um, Vanessa, what about you? Um, yeah, um, I think I, I would like to mention how I found uh, the framework of reproductive justice in particular, uh, a very productive arena to um, articulate different um, Latin American traditions as Feminismo Comunitario, eh, Marxist traditions in Latin America, indigenous ep epistemologies about life and building community, and uh, ancestralidad campesina or peasant ancestry, and more importantly, to um, understand a women's reproductive experiences. I, I've found this framework <laughs> tremendously helpful as a contemporary uh, place to think critically uh, from an intersectional perspective about these experiences, but also to connect um, intellectual questions with activism and political actions. I am um, I have to say I'm particularly critical about uh, the pro-choice narrative of feminist organizations in Bogota because I think when we're talking about um, decolonizing um, like the academic world, we, we should start like for our own places. So I, I believe that there are like a very colonial narratives from Bogota, the, the capital of, of the country to the rest of the of the territory. And um, and their narrative, they also pro choice narrative that use international organizations that are moni monitoring the implementation of the peace agreement. Um, well, as, as you may know, reproductive justice goes beyond this pro life, pro choice debate and um, has three primary principles, right? That is the right not to have a child, the right to have a child, and the right to parent children in safe and healthy environments. And um, Yes, it is uh, an American based framework, <laughs> but I, I believe that um, black feminists have done an amazing work recovering the claim of marginalized, impoverished and ra racialized um, communities to live all their reproductive experiences in a safe and dignified context. And um, although a safe and a dignified context, of course, could mean different things for different communities. I think this claim is, um, is a global demand. So, and I think I, I recognize, recognize the importance of opening up a conversation about reproductive justice in Colombia and Latin America, I would say, when um, I noticed the initial difficulties of um, feminist NGOs that work for reproductive rights in Colombia to discursively integrate their positions against forced abortions in the FARC with the defense of the liberalization of abortion. Of course, they did a great job developing a legal argument to recognize forced abortion as a form of sexual and reproductive violence against women in the armed conflict. And this uh, led to the recognition of women who were subjected to this form of violence as victims in need of reparation and assistance. But um, this argument remains under the framework of choice of an individual decision and um, of course, the fact that these women were forced um, aggravates this form of violence. But thinking about reproductive rights in terms of individual autonomy um, does not let us ask bigger questions about the political value of reproductive bodies in war. And um, I believe for like three main reasons. Um, first, 
It overlooks the analysis of the history of oppression of women from marginalized communities who become part of armed groups and what the reproduction means for military and political projects of war. Mm -hmm. it, second, it limits our understanding of reproductive violence since it does not take into consideration experiences such as ex-combatant women looking for their children who were placed for adoption by the state mm -hmm. because they were children of guerrilla parents, women who are parenting in the midst of war, or women who are trying to protect their children from the stigma of having an ex-combatant mother. Those experience well, are not, I'm sorry, this is like a very <laughs> community life. Those experiences are not about <laughs> decision making processes, but everyday life in disenfranchised communities. And third, um, it prevents us to see um, how these forms of violence are connected to international configurations of power. And I think it is important to say that during the most intense times of the armed conflict in Colombia between 1990, 1998 and 2002, Colombia was among the 10 countries sending most children for inter-country adoption. Yeah. So children from combatant women and families suffering war were being transferred to middle-class wealthy families in the global north. So uh, I believe that despite the valid critiques about uh, human rights, and, and Julieta mentioned this as a Western biased language that I, I share, I find the reproductive justice framework more easily aligned with um, the feminist agenda of ex-combatant, peasant, Black, and Indigenous communities um, in Colombia, who are not only demanding the right to make choices about their bodies, but to dignify their lives and the lives of their families. Women who teach us that motherhood um, is like, whether you think about it as a form of oppression or emancipation, is always a political and a, a political target, and um, and it is uh, a target of political violence because motherhood always represents a potential future in the hands of women. Thanks, Vanessa. I think this is such an interesting uh, framework because. What reproductive, reproductive justice does is displacing cho individual choice to understand the context and the conditions for people to make reproductive decisions, right? So it's not just about me as an individual, free-floating individual, but instead it's an individual that is grounded in communities and in a particular context that limits or enables particular decisions in relationship to the reproduction. For example, and, and I think I heard this from you in the past, how a lot of women actually decided to join FARC because that was a place where they could act, find some sort of um, freedom for themselves. Um, so it, it, that framework really complicates that. And then when you bring the decolonial one, which I think it's something that we are all working through, thinking what, what it means to think through reproductive justice and decolonial framework for thinking about reproduction. So perhaps we can, go a little bit on that question and talk about reproductive justice in particular. Vanessa started, started us off, so I would like to hear from Pasha and Tatiana. What are your thoughts on the contributions of reproductive justice for the discussion or the, the conversation about armed conflict and war? So Pasha, if you want to go. I'm sorry, I keep on forgetting to unmute myself. Um, I, I really like that we can jump straight into reproductive justice. It seems absolutely perfect in this moment. Um, and I'll just say that the reproductive, I'll just say I don't have like a long trajectory of work in reproductive justice, but I have read um, in particular a book that's edited by Alexis Pauline Gums, which I think is called uh, Revolutionary Motherhood. And, it, and it, it links into what Vanessa was explaining in terms of this sort of um, Black and um, women, US women of color kind of reframing of what does it mean to uh, 
to in, in embody motherhood, live motherhood along these same kind of reproductive justice principles. And um, I also want to bring in another thread and ask a question. So the other thread that I, I personally am finding really useful within sort of the broader reproductive justice discussion is the recognition of alternative kinship, kinship structures. And maybe this goes along in some ways with this sort of raising and safe and dignified context. And that of course needs to be defined by the cultural, socio-cultural dynamics of the communities. And I think that opens up enormous possibilities, of course, in terms of how do we configure, you know, how do we configure our, our, um, our kinship, our kinship relations. And here in particular, I think it's particularly interesting that the queering reproductive justice maneuvering, which reveals how diverse forms of kinship and care networks function and making them actually legible, visible, and um, elevating them out of the shadows. And what's important here is highlighting the non-normative reproductive arrangements, families, you know, that aren't recognized as families. And I want to bring that directly back to a certain kind of particular difficulty within the Colombian transitional justice process in its integral system. Of course, we have the commission, we have the special jurisdiction for peace, and we also have the unit that is, is um, mandated to search for disappeared persons. And what I want to highlight here is that in my conversations around that unit, one of the things that um, working, uh, interviewing and talking to people who identify in the populational sector designated as LGBTI, lesbian, um, gay, trans, bisexual, and intersex is that uh, people who are disappeared, who are, for example, trans, the, if their family member goes and denounces, says, I'm looking for my child, more likely they will name their child in their biological gender identity, not in the gender identity of that person as a trans individual, right? Second, or, you know, uh, you know, not identifying that that disappeared person might be gay or a lesbian or whatever other. So that, you know, is an erasure of that person's identity. Second, because of who they are, their family may never claim them or find that their disappearance is not really such a significant issue because they already, you know, uh, basically threw them out of the house and knew they were somewhere in the community, but then they left and oh well, they're gone, right? So there's no claiming of that person. And then third and most significantly here that I think that this sort of queering of reproductive justice helps us to think through is the fact that the chosen families of these um, LGBTI people cannot claim them because that unit that is to search for disappeared people does not recognize them as family because they are not biologically related, although they are their chosen family, which is their most intimate kinship structure. So I, I wanted to kind of like throw that piece in. And then I wanted to ask a question about how do you all kind of connect these incredibly potent um, pieces of intervention that come out of reproductive justice frames? And how does that come together with this sort of reproductive labor discussion that, um, that Tatiana raises in terms of Raquel Gutierrez and Silvia Frederici? I, Frederici, I am very interested to kind of, if you could potentially map the contours of how those come together. So, Pasha, that's a, that's a very interesting comment because this also applies to the Peruvian case. We have the unit for searching of the disappear that are using a genetic bank to identify the remaining, the remain, body remains to match them with family members for um, giving them the, the remains of their loved ones for appropriate burial. What it means when we think about kinship 
of indigenous and peasant communities that do not necessarily follow a biological kinship structure. We know that there are forms of extended uh, kinship, circulation of children in rural communities. So what does it mean? What are the, again, the gaps between the law and what happens on the ground? What's gonna happen with all this information that is gonna be collected? What are the impasses that the Ministry of Justice, because this is in the hands of the Ministry of, uh, Ministry of Justice, are going to run into when they're trying to match genetic information with the ones that are claiming they're the person that they claim is their relative, but probably is not, is, it may not be biologically related. So it, it's an interesting conversation that it, in, it goes, in, it, I think it connects to a lot of different contexts in which we see violence that has been perpetrated mainly against Indigenous and rural communities. Um, and I think this is an, an interesting question of kinship or we can also discuss, is this really queering kinship? Like what does it mean in, in your case is more clear, but um, can we think through the question of queering kinship uh, with the, the example that I am giving? I, I'm not really sure, but um, I just put it out there. Uh, Tati, if you have something to tell us or like answer to Pasha's question. Um... Yeah, well, first going to the, no, what can we take from or what does reproductive justice bring to the conversation about war, you know, and peace building? Mm. So I think that one of the many things that this very outrageous repression that we are seeing today in Colombia has shown us uh, since the 28th of, of April is that we cannot talk about peace building without like really addressing and taking seriously reproductive justice. Now there is, and I'm just gonna give a couple of uh, like figures to, uh, Vanessa mentioned some of them. No? So since the 28th of April, this is less than 15 days, uh, an NGO Temblores, which is, has been amazing documenting what's happening because there aren't any institu well, institutions from the government doing it. Uh, so they have documented at least, at least 40 people killed most of them young people, over a thousand arbitrary detentions, 28 people with severe injuries in their eyes, 12 victims of sexual violence. And as Vanessa said, over a hundred people have been forcibly disappeared, knowing less than 15 days. But before the national strike started on the 28th of April, we also learned that less than 40% of Colombians can eat, can afford two meals a day. And something we, we've we heard over and over from the people in the various points of resistance uh, and in various points of demonstrations across the, across the country, particularly in Cali, is that now they are you know, eating better and they are having more access to like food that than out of solidarity of people than in their home in their homes. And now so when we think of reproductive justice, we have to of course ask the question of what does it mean to live and die and be killed and what does parenting mean in this sort of militarized context with these outrageous inequalities. Uh, and, and of course, if we go like to very specific uh, issues of reproductive health, for example, we have to ask, and uh, we have to ask ourselves, you no, know, the role of, for example, tear gas and the impact we already have, we already know it has in you know, in reproductive systems. Um, so that that's there. But I feel that the other side of the questions and the invitations, probably that reproductive justice justice brings is how to think and act strategically if we, wanna, if we want to actually move towards futures free of those reproductive viol violences and not think of, as Vanessa was saying before, how to guarantee dignified context to, no, for parenting. Um, so, well, just that in relation to reproductive justice and in relation to, para, to Pasha's question, mm. And, and I think I'm gonna I'm gonna answer this based on on my field work, some oh, based on my relationships with the people I work with. Is that something that took me a very very long time to see? Was 
So when I started doing this first stage of fieldwork in 2016, something that happened is that when I got there and I started talking to people, I very quickly saw that that label of paraquitos that's so cruel, well, had vanished, like no one used that label. And yet there was something about these teenagers that was different. And, and what I realized is that unlike other contexts where those people are understood as problematic because of who their biological fathers are. In this case, I saw that they were understood as problematic for the community because of the role of the mother and the failure of their, in the expectation of nurture and motherhood. Uh, so there was this constant blame placed on them in relation to, to who these teenagers were. Mm. So that's when I understood that the naturalization of the labor of motherhood played a huge role, not only in making these experiences of transgenerational violence invisible, but also in really uh, making in a very violent way invisible the experience of violence and the various forms of violence that the mothers had experienced, even in raising the child. So I'm going to leave there. Yeah, that's a, that's a really interesting thing. And I would like to add to something that you just uh, all said, it, and is that reproductive justice in many ways, and here building on the work of Elizabeth Hoover, is not just, um, or allows us not to think simply about reproduction in biological terms, but also what it means uh, to reproduce, um, you know, to produce uh, a culture, reproduce a society, right? Um, and how the violence that, a lot of indigenous and black communities have experienced is really uh, dismembering or a sever severing of the social fabric of the communities that really limits the possibilities of reproducing, you know, their, their language, their communities, uh, their histories, their traditions. So it is another form of reproductive violence uh, that it's not just about you know, giving birth or having children, but it's, it's a broader context. And we also, um, this was, I, I found this in the page, uh, in the website of the Truth Commission, how um, the exposure to glyphosate, I don't know if that's the word we use in English, um, have impact on uh, biological reproduction, uh, birth defects, um, miscarriages. So, and these are, so the government is actually trying to reinstate aerial aspersions of glyphosate to eradicate um, coca plantations in different parts of the country, knowing that this is cancerogenic, that it has uh, adverse reproductive effects on populations that ne live nearby these, um, the, the, the crops. And also the aspiration doesn't, is not possible to focus just on the cocoa plantations. They are meshed with, um, you know, staple foods, uh, food that people, you know, the, the products that people use for their daily sustenance. So how this is really going to kill really the possibility for people to feed themselves at the same time. Uh, so that's, an that's another thread through which we can see the connections with uh, reproductive justice. So, um, so I would like, Vane, do you want to say something? No, I just wanted uh, um, to like to answer a Pasha's question in relation yeah. to what Tatiana was saying about like um, like this very intricate connection between peace building and and reproductive justice. And I just like to give um, you know like two examples from from my research probably. And um, like first you mentioned that uh, ex-combatant women and their children survived thanks to what Pasha was um, mentioning as non-normative kinship arrangements. It was people from indigenous and peasant communities who took care of those children, took care of those women. And sometimes they even claimed that they were the relatives in front of the state so they could protect those peoples from um, state violence. Mm -hmm. So when the anti-peace uh, accord movements were, um, you know, like defending, defending the natural family and uh, 
like to talk about this um, heteronormative nuclear family, it's that's not only a, a very authoritarian affirmation, it's also a direct attack against the social fabric that made possible survival in yeah. the midst of, of war. And like another example, and this is like to just to mention the dramatic very, very dramatic difference between um, ex-combatant women who demobilized individually because they deserted or because they just decided it that way and entered in their individual reintegration program and women who demobilized as part of the peace agreement and are part of the collective reincorporation program. Women who are part of the first program, they are um, raising their children alone in the midst of poverty with no um, no uh, networks with no social support uh, women who are uh, in the rain corporation process they are building communities where collective mothering is a norm it is a norm and everyone is involved everyone in the community is involved involved mothers fathers not only to take care of their children but also to take care of the social conditions and the territories where they those children are, are growing and living yeah yeah that's a that's a great comment so uh, i am mindful of the time and we have 15 minutes left so i would like to open the floor for questions from the audience so if anyone has a question um I don't know, Joe, if people can unmute themselves to ask the question. Yeah, we can set that up. Yeah, so uh, whoever wants to ask a question, please feel free to unmute yourselves and you can ask the question to the panel. Or if you have a particular question for someone, that's also welcome. Or thanks, as Yvonne says, uh, you can raise your hand or um, write your question on the chat as well. Asha, did you want to say something? I was just going to say, maybe if there aren't that many questions from the audience, maybe we could ask questions of each other. Yeah, yeah, or or or, or perhaps uh, we can also. I I, I really I am uh, interested. Or I see Sarah raise her hand. So Sarah, uh, yeah, you can ask the question. Oh well, um, first of all, I just want to thank you for these incredible presentations. Really so so moving and so astute about such a terrible situation but contributing so much to how we understand reproduction not just as an effect you know but really as a cause of of so much that happens during war and so much that happens during violence and what that tells us you know about how we theorize other things and i guess i, I really wanted to ask you um about that question um you know angela davis would say it's the prison that enables us to see so clearly the connections between sexual violence reproductive violence between the violence of the state um the militarized carceral violence of of control via racialized definitions of identity and i'm wondering um whether I don't know that there really is a theoretical framework that would put war at this center, militarized violence at the center of analyzing reproduction, but it seems to me that's very much what you're contributing. Um, and I, I don't know if you know if maybe there is a model that puts militarized violence at the center, because because an implication of what you're saying is that reproductive violence is it really isn't an effect only of of that kind of situation it's it's very much a cause and if, and if that's the case you know that's really such a radical you know description of the social forces that that are cohering around the renaming of a child 
you know, the whole category of a child um, as, a, as you put it, as a problem for the community. Thanks, Hal, for your question. So who wants to start? Sasha, you want to start? I, I mean, I, I don't really have, I just want to kind of riff off of some of that. I think it. I think it's very interesting to bring up um, Angela Davis and thinking about sort of an abolitionist approach and um, thinking about the, um, the way in which the prison industrial system functions, particularly in the US and how she um, connects all of you know sexual violence into these histories and in police brutality and also thinking about um, sexual violence and during per the period of enslavement in the United States I and mean, just linking it all together. And I think what I would take from that is not so much um, trying to identify a particular entry point, like, you know, Angela Davis really, and well, how can I put it? What I think, what, what's so in incredible about her analysis is that it allows us to think synthetically, right? And also bridge across struggles. So like in her, um, one of her more recent books, she, she talks about Ferguson to Gaza Strip, right? So it allows us to kind of think so, um, synthetically about the kinds of open air containments that happen at Ga in Gaza Strip as like a prison, right, under Israeli occupation, and that we can think through those dynamics as unique yet connected. And I think that what I wanted, would want to do is think through the Colombian context as unique yet connected, right? We're talking about the same kind of military and police apparatus today coming down upon Cali and Bogota and other urban settings, right? In which it is all about absolute repression. And that repression includes sexual violence as, you know, as they say the bread of every day, right? So, I, I mean, I think there's ways that we can take these sort of frameworks and they help us to sort of read through juxtaposition. Um, and I guess I kind of want to just drop that in there. Mm -hmm. Vane or Tatiana, do you have anything? Yeah, I, I was waiting to say if Vanessa wanted to jump in first, but uh, so I guess like right now what I'm thinking is that of course we cannot we cannot understand war as an isolated you no know, and a kind of in a bubble. You no, know? we understand that war and militarization takes place within you know a capitalist patriarchal system and that in context like Latin America, we and well in this case Colombia, we know that those are very much phrases, sexist, heteronormative, and and in that way we we kind of see how not reproductive labor in this case is being not coerced to make all of that structure and system work. Uh, so. So if we think of that, then of course, thinking about war and not only sexual violence in the context of war, but militarization and, and um, dynamics of war, then, then yeah, reproductive labor is part of, of the way that that same system and architecture just like you know, works. Uh, I think I didn't say, I didn't say anything concrete, uh, but it is different, it's, it's difficult for me to think like separately, not the the to to yet yeah, to take separately the role of reproductive violence or gender based violence from the actual uh, from the dynamics of war and peace building and conflict resolution, whatever that is. So maybe Vanessa has something better and sharper to say about that. <laughs> Uh, no, no, I think, uh, I think you're absolutely right. And I'm, um, yes, I think it's a very, very provoking question and comment, um, thinking about this connection between militarized violence and um, reproductive justice. I, um, I think one of the reasons why I started to um, 
work with ex-combatant women who uh, had children in the midst of war was about a question of um, like that that experience uh, in in like the experience of bringing life and the experience of mothering in a context of of death, and um, some of them, uh, one of them told me once at least some of me will stay in this world. And I keep wondering how those uh, radical acts of hope uh, make possible, make life possible in communities that are uh, resisting extermination every day. And I'm not romanticizing that. I'm not romanticizing those sacrifices, but but I, 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 I th I'm thinking now, how is how are those sacrifices um, about having or not having children related to this like ingrained um, mi militarized um, quotidian life in, in Colombia? Like, you know, like what we're seeing now in the cities and is getting the international attention is what has been happening for decades in, in rural areas in Colombia. And um, how we keep like exposing ourselves to, you know, like fighting for a better future, you know, like most of us are not vaccinated. Police, the police is killing and disappearing people who protest. And we still go out to the streets almost every day because there is some hope there. Like at what cost? I don't know. Like, are we really, you know, like looking at the structures of this um, militarized lives? I, I don't know either. I just want to say something quickly to Sarah's question. And I don't know if I wouldn't put it in a, I wouldn't put the question in a cause effect framework because it's hard for me to think in those terms. But I think what we are seeing in this conversation is that violence requires reproduction for its expression. Because if we are talking, if we think about the violence that we're seeing in armed conflicts, for example, it's just, it's about destruction, but it's also about land control. Reproduction is the best way to achieve that. Is this, you know, it's disintegrating communities, it's uh, expelling people. Um, it can be uh, also limiting the births of some groups. So we see it, so I rather, I would rephrase the question to say that reproduction is necessary for the expression of violence or for war. Um, that would be my, my contribution to this um, question. Uh, I have two and I'm mindful of the time. So let's try to keep it very short. Uh, Castriela, do you want to say something? Welcome, Castriela. So happy to see you. Thanks, Julieta. Thank you so much for this wonderful conversation. Hi, Vanessa, Hachas, and everyone here. I think that this is a very, very important issue. I have problem with my cameras. I will try, I don't know if you can see me, something, okay. So, okay, nice to see you. Yes, I, I love this conversation because I have in an, another conversation some weeks ago, and the main discussion was about decolonizing anthropology. And this is a way to decolonize anthropology fields to bring about these kind of conversations in which we can disrupt traditional conceptualizations and also understandings on, on the way we can um, examine and critically the, the world context in Latin America, in this case, Peru and Colombia. I really appreciate this conversation because as many of you know, as well as uh, I'm working as well in this particular issue, but to make an emphasis on I focus in, 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 in the intersections between race, racism, genders, and bodies in the framework of the Colombian American conflict. So it's really interesting the way in which Vanessa is addressing the, 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 the motherhood issue. Because as she um, emphasizes, it's not romanticizing these particular issues in relation to. Uh, as combatant woman, but uh, I remember that Professor Thayden, Elizabeth Thayden asked me um, two years ago in the National Congress of Anthropology here in Cali, that you are in like kind of in Poland because you are emphasizing as Vanessa did right now, 
in issues that maybe society don't want to know or don't like it. So to show another perspective how to understand guerrilla's world, <coughs> sorry, the place of women within guerrilla armed forces. And I'm wondering about how Vanessa is addressing, for example, sorry, <coughs> The, mod, the changes, the, 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 the conceptions of motherhood of the combatant women <coughs> before and after the peace accord. Because, let me, let me a second, take some results, take water and... Yeah. Oh, that's your left. Uh, I think I, I wanted to address, uh, while Casriela is gone, uh, I wanted to address uh, Miguel Lopez question. Um, I don't know, Miguel, if you want to unmute yourself. Castri, we're gonna give the, since you left. Uh... I come back. Okay, <laughs> come back then, you can do it. Yeah, yeah, See, yeah. Okay. Uh, yeah. The change between the, 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 the conceptions of motherhood before and after the peace accord. Why? Because, uh, you know, uh, one of the things that many as combatant women are telling us today is that they were not in traditional role of women in Colombia when they were uh, within the world contest, but now they are reproducing traditional world of motherhood. So how can you disrupt these particular changes in your world and explain that critically this particular changes that uh, the the com quotation uh, the society has forced many as combatant women to reproduce traditional roles of women in that way traditional roles of motherhood so how do you are addressing that in the in your in your research and and also uh, with the questions or putting in conversations with Angela Davis and many the colonizing world I wonder if um, in how the context of transitional justice in the case that is unique, as we know, because they are addressing the issues, the reproductive uh, uh, problems in, in, in the construction of truth. But at the same time, um, by the work made by indigenous and black people, the uh, peace accord is also addressing the rights issue. So I was working um, within the truth commission last year. I was advisor of what the one of the commissioners that unfortunately killed, uh, sorry, uh, died last year, uh, Commissioner uh, Angela Salazar. I was working with with her, and one of the main um, concerns of ethnic racial people within the three commissions was how the three commissions are is gonna address the colonial part, colonial racist patterns of uh, the world in in the report. So they, how, I would like to know how you are understand or analyzing the race, uh, the intersection between race are conflict and resistance within the work you are doing right now. Thank you. Thanks, Castriela, for the question. So very quickly, we can go around because I have another question in the chat that, that I don't want to, you know, end uh, without acknowledging that and maybe addressing this quickly. Bunny? Uh, yeah, okay. I thought we were going to listen to the other questions. So I'm going to uh, answer very shortly the question about motherhood and, and leave you uh, to answer the second question. Um, so I think you're absolutely right. And that's, as you just uh, said, Castilla, that's a, a central conversation among ex-combatant women right now. I can talk from like the place where I work in Caquetá, but I'm sure it must be different in different places. So um, 
here in Caquetá, women, women who are a, in this reincorporating process are talking about all the time, just as you mentioned it, you know, like how are we going to make this transition without going back to the heteronormative structures that we were fighting in the same place. And um, I think they have found like very different strategies to resist to that. There is a great campaign that they have here in Caquetá that is called Compañero Usted También Puede, like Comrade, you also can do it. Uh, mm -hmm. Like you can, you know, like raise the children with us. You can also cook. You can also, you know, like share the chores of, of the house. So, um, Yes, I think you're you're absolutely right. They are talking about that, but they are also, you know, like finding um, ways to resist in connection with, and and you know that this is like a very interesting thing that happened. How they started to. Uh, build conversation with feminist movements that um, had, you know, like different positions about war and peace before, and now they are like working together. Yes, uh, thank you for the question. Is there anything else that we have that we want to say in relation to Castiela's uh, question? And if anybody else wants to say something. Pasha, you want to say? I just want to say something very briefly, but it's sort of tangential, but I think that it, I mean, this is probably for me to talk to Castrela at a different moment, but one of the things that I think is so fascinating is, um, and I'm sure Castrela has, you know, a lot of insight on this, is how it is that the woman family generation approach came to be, and how it is that, the, you know, how did that become this coalition between Indigenous and Afro-descendant women, women, um, uh, activists and advocates in the process and how and where, you know, these ideas around gender justice and racialization and colonization mm -hmm. play out. I think that this, th there's so much there to unpack. And I just wanted to kind of mention it, even though there's not time to really un unpack that in its full right. Yeah. So, uh, you know, I'm glad that we all, uh, we know Castriela, so the conversation can keep going on, which is uh, really interesting. The, the question that I have here is by Miguel Lopez, and he asked, in Central and South America during the Cold War, the militaries had the idea that subversion was hereditary. So forcing women to miscarriage was used to eradicate socialism. Did one of you say that this continues in Colombia today? Does anybody have an, an answer to that? Have you encountered this or, or not really at all? Well, uh, I, I think the only, what I could say about this is that at least in, case of, in cases of children born as a result of war-related sexual violence, what we see coming from the more international literature is that, that it trans, mm, that that's the case, not necessarily in relation to socialism, but the question of what's transmitted from the biological father to the fetus and eventually to the child is very much there. And you see it in context, in not conflict context like uh, the genocide in Rwanda or the war in the former Yugoslavia, um, northern in Nigeria or northern Uganda. But in the case of Colombia, I haven't found it. And I think one of the fractures in relation to the label of, of little paramilitary is there. And is that you, although it could indicate that there is a connection and, and a, an idea of transmission there, um, then there isn't really because there is a fracture there. And what happens is that the child, the teenager, it does belong, he, do, he or she does belong to the community. The, the blame and the violence comes more in terms of reproductive labor than in terms of transmission. And in terms of transmission, Kimberly Thayton has not written um, about this idea of transmission and local biologists working, of course, uh, from previous yeah, works. But. Yeah. Um, Pasha, do you want to say something? Yeah, I just wanted to say something that would allow us to sort of think this through in those historic patterns of violence. And I do think that this point that Miguel Lopez brings up is significant and there are prede predecessor events. And I want to mention the um, uprising of Tupac Amaru and um, Micaela Bastidas in 
in um, in the Peruvian Andes against colonialism, and that when, of course, when they caught um, Tupac Amaru, they 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 quartered him in the main plaza of Cusco. But what they did to Micaela Bastidas, I think, is very significant in terms of these lines. And what they did was they took her and all of the females of her whole extended family. And what they did was they put them in chains and forced them into a death march from Cusco to Lima. And the goal was to eradicate the revolutionary matriz or the revolutionary subversive uterus. We need to eradicate that collective uterus. So I think that that, 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 that idea that Miguel Lopez brings up, it, it is rooted in a colonial, um, a colonial enactment that keeps on repeating in all these different ways and forms and fashions. Yeah. Yeah, so I'm, I'm mindful of the time. Vanessa, do you want to say something quick? I saw yeah, you unmuting just, yourself. <laughs> I'm sorry. No, no, no. I just wanted to like uh, think for the question. I would say that I haven't seen something like that clear and direct here. I would say that like this um, policies of extermination in relation also to the question, uh, Castrela's question about intersectionality and race are against the marginalized and racialized communities. Although um, it is, you know, like, important to see how like violence against um, mothers and pregnant women have um, been uh, has been there since the bipartisan violence when women were assassinated, pregnant women were assassinated, their bellies were cut and their fetus replaced by stones or animals. So like motherhood and pregnant women are an important uh, political and uh, political target and um, military target, not with that specific statement of inheriting socialism, but definitely as a form of like exterminating certain communities. Yeah, and I just want to add at the end, oh, sorry, my video. Um, uh, yeah, so uh, I just want to add to this question very quickly. I think this was more visible in the Peruvian case in the 1990s. The sterilization program was presumably addressed as a way to not only reduce poverty, but as an anti-subversive strategy to limit the possibility of rural women giving birth to potential senderistas or children that could join the ranks of Sendero Luminoso, the Maui's guerrilla. This is a contentious event because the document that talks about this is a document that is lost. Nobody really knows where this document is, the original document. And this is really a riddle, like a historical riddle for, uh, for, for people working on this topic. And, and in this case, I'm talking about myself. Anyways, uh, thanks so much for staying 12 minutes longer. Um, before this ends, I want to um, give a special thanks to Professor Sarah Franklin, the director of ReproSoc, to Joe Cotton, Lois Gibbs, and Yvonne Frankfurt, who made this event possible. Thank you so much.